You can always create your own world. This land used to cost nothing, now it's very expensive. All the land you see there belongs to Russians. No one is willing to do this job, it's too tough. Do you identify as Brazilians? I'm a Russian Brazilian. Our daughter is getting married. When did you get married? When I was 14. It happens. We do not live in peace now. People from South America want to move to Russia. There's a theory that they will help to cultivate the Russian Far East. I'm worried that they might be deceived. 130 million people live in Russia. Why can't I? Hi everyone, this is the longest business trip in the history of the Redoxia project. More than 20 hours on a plane, with several transfers, many hours by car, sometimes driving on shattered, dusty roads. But this is not what makes this trip one of the most amazing and unimaginable in my entire journalistic career. Geographically, we are in Brazil, but we did not come to Brazil, we came to Russia. Not to that geographical Russia, which we all live in, but to the country that disappeared more than a hundred years ago with the October Revolution. We came to see people from that Russia, who preserved that culture in their hearts. You can see it through their appearance and religion. We came here to see the old believers. Their communities have lived here, in Brazil, for many years. They do not like to let other people into their closed communities. It took us several months to negotiate our visit here. And the reason why we came here is that now quite a few of the old believers living in Brazil are packing their belongings and returning to their historical homeland, mostly to the Far East, to Siberia. They're given land there, and they start a new, old life there in their homeland, in the hope of changing the homeland too. We've just learned that we're about the same age. Yes. You're 46, right? I'm 45. So we're completely... But that's not why we were speaking in an informal way. That's a custom here. Yes. I think later you will notice a difference in the language. It's very interesting. Very resonant and interesting language. Can you introduce me to this place? Here is our only house. There's the house. Yes, that's the back side. The front side is there. May I take a look? Of course. Here's a garage. It has a few rooms inside. A storeroom or an office. There's a sauna. There's not much there. The house is that way. How many cars do you have? I have one car now. I've just sold another car because I'm moving to Russia. This car will be sold soon, too. How many of you are going? For now, it's about 20 of us during the first wave. A few families will be moving, including your family. I only have a wife, a daughter and a 10-year-old son. So it's four of us in one family. Do people discourage you from going? Yes, many are doing that. They think it's a mad idea and that my life might be under threat. What do you say to them? I think it's up to them what to think. I've been to Russia three times, and I know they're wrong. And that's it. Here are some details which are illustrating the lives of the locals. You see a parked car and the plane of a settler behind it. Well, people need to irrigate the land. It's common here to use a plane for this. The country is big. Here is some historical context of the reasons why Russian old believers live here. In the 17th century, Russia saw the church split. 
The old believers were driven out to the east. By the end of the 20th century, they ended up in the eastern Siberia and far east, where many of them lived in numerous communities. Then, in 1917, the Bolsheviks came to power. Obviously, they saw the old believers as class and ideological enemies. Many of the old believers were repressed, so they had to leave their homes and flee to China. They stayed in China for a few more decades. They worked really hard on their lands, and as a result, they prospered. After World War II, communists took over China. The old believers were repressed again, which forced them to move once again. Most of them ran away to South America. In the following decades, they spread all over the continent, including countries like the USA. I think you know that in the USA, everyone has to adapt to the local culture. In a generation or two, the old believers lost their identity. Here, in South America, it's different. The old believers who live here are still Russians. They speak their language, preserve their traditions. They are still a part of the old Russia that no longer exists. You had 100 hectares. Yes, that's not much. Based on contemporary estimations, it's not much. Hard to lead a decent life on land of this size. Uh, yes, I see your point. I'm just thinking that it's not easy to imagine a Russian farmer with this amount of land. I mean, you could survive with it, but it will not be enough for a good life. If you want to live well, you need to choose a good niche. What have you been doing with your 100 hectares? We've grown soy and corn here. We have summer and winter harvest seasons. Soy and corn. Yes. Did you get enough money to live during these two seasons? Yes, it was just enough, but say, we couldn't afford an expensive car or something luxurious. It was just enough. Right, so you're not a rich man. I'm not. Are there rich Russian people here? Yes. Like, super rich, yes. Are they farmers too? Yes. Cool. Is this your evening leisure? Yes. But I'm too old for that. It's for the kids. How much land do you have? Today, crops and livestock, somewhere around 5,000 hectares overall. 5,000 hectares. 5,700. Do you grow corn and soy? So you're harvesting soy now and you're planting corn? Yes. But it's not all for harvesting. Now we're preparing new land. We have both land for crops and livestock, 50-50. Dairy livestock? No, for meat only. We buy cows with calves. Then we separate them and sell the calves. The cow is now with another calf. When it raises a new calf, we either tip it or sell for breeding. Do you remember, I said that the old believers fly over their fields. So, as not to sound unfounded, I asked to join a flight. You know I'm always up for it. If there's a chance, I will ask for a flight. It's beautiful. How old is it? 1982 or 84? This, if you don't know, is the Cessna, the most common small aircraft in the world. All you can see now is Russian land. Russian. Because it belongs to Russians. In Brazil.
You were saying more than a thousand people live in the village. Yes, quite a lot of us. If we count everybody, my mother has about 90 grandchildren. Wow. And that's just her. What if there are 10 like her in one family? How many children do you have? Not too many. We have only four. You call that not many? This is Dmitry Kuzmin and Praskovia, his wife. This is their house. What do you call it? Izba? Yes, Izba, or house. Who designed the project? We did. You did. And this semicircular balcony? Yes, we designed it that way with a carpenter. Is it made of wood? No, it's made of brick. Brick and plaster. The upper part is made of concrete. It's reinforced concrete. That's it. What about heating? It's not needed here. Here's our heating, the fridges. Air conditioners are the opposite. Is this an antenna? Yes. Do you watch TV? It's for telephones. Dmitry has seven children. That's right. Five girls and two boys. The sons are both here. How many grandchildren do you have? Sixteen. Sixteen grandchildren. How old are you? I'm 62. 62 years old and 16 grandchildren. That's impressive. How and when did you move here? We came here for the first time to have a look. It was in... 1978. Where were you born? In Hong Kong. Hong Kong? On the way from China? Yeah. Wow. My family lived there for about half a year. Where was your father born? In Russia or in China? In China. And your grandfather? Do you remember him? I do. Was he born in Russia? Yes. What did he say about Russia? I don't remember much. Immigrants from Russia, Germany and Italy helped Brazil to develop. They arrived after the Second World War? Yes. Local people. They started working when they learned from our people, from immigrants. This area used to be very poor. And now? Now it's the most expensive land in the country. I have a little dictionary. When you communicate with Russians here, you very quickly catch on to this language they speak. And this language, we understand, it's from old Russia, pre-revolutionary, that has lived through all these decades of struggle. I composed my own little dictionary to see familiar words sound different. Bivat instead of bovayet, happens. Shibko instead of silna, very. Hudaya instead of plachaya, bad. Polisman, nice word to call a policeman. Tudi, sudi, tama, old versions of direction words. They use masculine and feminine forms to refer to Brazilian people. And my favorite one. They say fazendiors, to refer to people who own a fazenda or a piece of land. It's something like a kulak. Here they are, fazendiors. It's a great language, very melodic. American farmer or a fazender in Portuguese. In Russian, we used to say Hutorianin, because they lived in Hutors. I don't know how to say it in Russian. So you are a corn rope, a soy rope. Yeah. Not many of us live here in Goyas. There's a bigger Russian village in Mato Grosso state. Do you mostly communicate with Russians or with Brazilians too? 
Mostly with Russians. We communicate with Brazilians for business only. Do you define yourself as a Russian or a Russian-Brazilian person? I'll be honest, I identify as Russian. Brazilians also say I am Russian. But when I go to Russia, I feel like a Brazilian because I was born here. Are you a patriot of Brazil? Of course. I was born and I still live here. I'm a Brazilian patriot. We were born and raised here. Is Portuguese your second language? It is. It's the second language because I started learning Portuguese when I was 10, although I was born here. So you're not bilingual? Why? I am. Are you a native speaker of both languages? That's right. Where did you grow up? Here in the village or somewhere else? I lived here until I turned 10. What is your native language? Brazilian. Portuguese. Yes. How about Russian? How should I put it? I don't speak Russian as well as Portuguese. My mother died when I was a child. Since then, I've lived in a city with my uncle. I lived with Brazilian people, so I forgot a lot of Russian. What about you? What's your native language? I learned Russian first. Then I learned Portuguese at school. Which language do you speak between the two of you? In Portuguese? Yes, we speak Portuguese more often than Russian. So, are you Brazilians? Yeah, not sure. I think I'm Russian-Brazilian. And you, Alexei? Yes, the same. I like this Brazilian saying. It means agriculture is like a big factory without a roof. I see. A factory without a roof. Yeah, without a roof. So you entirely depend on Yes, we depend on climate. We get a good harvest if the climate is good, and income is high. How was it in 2019? It was good. We still have a good soy harvest. What is this? We store raw grain here. Then it goes in the dryer. In that container, we dry it. How long does it take to dry? It's like soy, not much. At the top, it's 18-19% humidity. And when the grain reaches the bottom, it's 5% drier and ready to be sold. Is the grain collected from here by your clients? No, from the other side. We have our grain warehouse there. There, we load it onto trucks and send it off. How much do you earn? How many people do you employ to work here? We have about 22, 23 permanent workers. Brazilians? Yes. Do you own these vehicles? Yes. Is it cheaper than renting? Yes, if you use it for a few seasons, it's more beneficial. I see. It makes sense in the long run. How much do the seeding machines cost? Today, this seeding machine costs about 
$100,000. Only the seating machine. And with the tractor, together they cost more than $200,000. And how many of these do you have? We have three of these on our land. So you earn enough to afford these tractors, machines, and hiring people. A year of poor crops won't affect you too much, I guess. That's right. And we never think about just one season, just one harvest. We have to always look to the medium term and the long term. What is long term for you? 10, 15 years? For me, the medium term is five years. And the long term is 20 years. Do I understand correctly that this is the new direct seeding technology that eliminates plowing? My understanding is that the land should be plowed first with a plowing machine. And later you do the sowing. Now the first stage is not necessary. That's right. It's become possible after the process in the 1970s, 1980s. We had to plow and use limestone back then. We also had to fertilize the land. Modern technology helps us avoid these stages. Now, we don't need to plow. Agriculture is like a science now. It's precision farming. We know what to do and how to do it. Exactly. I deliberately chose a very Russian scenery. Look at this road. The trees, similar to birches, and that rain cloud, so similar to the motherland. Why did I choose it? Because everything that I see here, everything that I feel here, is, besides the fact that this is a very cool story in itself, also an important lesson that I want to convey to you. When I worked on my TV show, I made a story about decolicization and collectivization. This film is about the Russian peasantry that was destroyed by the Soviet government, that mostly aimed to destroy the class of prosperous peasants. They were entrepreneurs of their time and really helped local areas to develop. The people we film here are very similar to those peasants. You know what Russian agriculture looks like. Devastated, empty fields, abandoned villages. I don't need to say any more. When I look at this fertile land owned and cultivated by Russian entrepreneurs, I think how different could life in Russia have been if the Soviet government had not come to power. I was nine when I moved here, in the early 1970s. This land here was very cheap at the time. No one wanted it. It was not fertile. You could not grow crops here. My father bought a fazenda here. My brother invited an agronomist to have a look at the land. The land was tested at a laboratory. They wanted to know what could be done to grow soy here. The lab test showed that nothing could grow on this land. My father reassured him. He said that in 10 years, the land will be more expensive. Well, it took 20 years instead of 10. 
стало столь же урождать, сколько... Now this land is very expensive. Сегодня здесь It is twice as expensive here than the land in Paran. I see. And now it's several times more expensive than it was 40 years ago? 40 years ago, the land here cost nothing. Now it is precious. Now one hectare costs $20,000. I've heard that before the Russians came here, there was no limestone. It was delivered from God knows where. That's right. It was 1,200 kilometers south of here. There was no limestone here. That's why the land here was not fertile. We used a van to get 10 tons for each trip. It was tough. Listening to you and Pavel, I've started to realize that in Russia, agriculture is 30 to 40 years behind in comparison to what you have here. You're right. In Russia, they plow most of the land. It's not good for land, though. I don't know if our no-till method can work in Russia, since it's so cold there. No-till is what we were talking about when you don't plow land between harvesting seasons. That's correct. I know they used this method in the Soviet Union, but now very few people do. I can drive straight with the help of GPS. I've been driving straight for 18 meters. Then I will turn and drive 18 meters in another direction. GPS shows the exact point. Is it really more precise than your own eyes? Of course it is. Really? How can you drive straight without a GPS? You can only do it if you have rows. Pavel climbed up on the roof of the combine. He looks like the captain of a ship. Look at him. I recall a moment in my life when I was a child. We lived at our country house. There was a farm nearby. I used to come and have a look at the combine. I would stand there because I wanted a ride on that machine. Sometimes they did give me a ride. It's one of my best childhood memories. My ancestors were peasants. I feel like I belong to this heritage too. I've just had a ride for the first time in 40 years or so. I recalled the feelings, the fragrances that were so familiar to me. It's worth mentioning that the field where I was waiting for a ride as a child is now turned into a new housing community. People need houses. Who wants to do this kind of job? Out here in the hot sun? No one wants to do it. You simply need to get used to it. You need to be able to perform this work and to like it. If you don't get used to it, you will never want to work. It's a tough job. You have no air conditioning, dust flies in your eyes, but if you do not do it, you will have no food to eat. But what about your sons? How old are they? 16 and 14. How did you explain to them that this is necessary? We're still in the process. I just take them here. And I tell them that we're all going to work. I explain that it's essential. You have no choice. Hi there, Alexei. Hi. Are you related? This is my youngest son. Uh, where are your older sons today? They're irrigating the land. Your son works with you, right? Yes. When will he receive his own land and become a farmer? They already have their own land. You mean your youngest son also? Yes. How old are you? 
I'm 19. Okay. And you already have your own land. So can you explain, when does a son receive a piece of land? Is it a present from you or what happens? No, it's not a present. We take out a loan to buy it. We share what we have between all of us. It's common land. So I understand that you buy land when your children are growing up. Then the parents and the children pay back the loan together. That's right. We will pay it back in 10 years. Do you have a problem keeping your children from excessive use of computers and phones? One of my sons was obsessed with it. He was a gamer. I asked them to do so much work here so that there was no time left for phones. I see. Larion had a problem. His sons were playing computer games. He came and said, Go and work in the fields. Here's the tractor. Here's the combine. Go and work. Did it help? Yes. Now he uses his hands to work with combines instead of playing with his phone. What helped you preserve your cultural identity through the years? How did you manage to preserve your language and religion? It's hard to say. I think... Our parents tried to build our settlements far away from cities. They lived in villages. They preferred a country lifestyle. They were keen on preserving our culture, our religion. There are many subdivisions, old believers and new believers. That's the main subdivision. Then there are priesthood and priestless. That's within the old believers movement. That is religious service with or without a priest. Within the priestless movement, there are more subdivisions. One of the movements is split into two groups. The first stands for one cross. The second stands for two. What does this mean? You can use only one variant of the cross to bless. Those who stand for one cross say you can only use this special cross to do that. Those who stand for two crosses say you can use this special cross or another one to do that, because old mosaics and icons depict different crosses. So the cross is when you make the sign of the cross, any sign of blessing. However, only a priest is allowed to bless, but they don't have priests. Today is Sunday. No one is going to work. That's right. No one works on Sundays. It's prohibited. It's a holy day for you. That's right. We can't work. It's a holy day. Do you pray twice a week? We usually pray on Saturday nights. Now, during the Great Fast, we pray two more times on Sundays, in the morning and at night. So now we pray three times a week. Does everyone from your neighborhood come to pray? If they can, they do. Can you explain something? You are the priestless. Yes. How do you pray then? Who organizes the services? I act as a senior priest here. I am a senior in the local church. However, this doesn't mean that I manage the local community. I was only elected to organize services in our church for one year. How do you elect your senior priest? Do people vote? Not really. Now there aren't many candidates. My father was one of them, but he died in 2016. Now I'm the oldest person, so I'm a good candidate for this role. We have an elected senior priest who organizes the service. How do you elect him? We all get together and we choose the best candidate. 
Does this person act as a priest? Yes. So he reads the prayer, he engages people, he does the bowing, performs marriage ceremonies and baptizing. Do you go to church? Do you call this place a church or a prayer room? It's a church. And does the whole community gather there? Yes. During my first expedition, I kept asking, how are they baptized in the prayer room? And how is the service in the prayer room organized? Until one woman said to me, Forgive me, Olga, for Christ's sake, but what is happening in our prayer room, we don't have the right to tell you about it. We can't talk about it. Yes, they didn't let us in either. We can discuss everything but our spiritual life. Don't be offended, but we simply can't tell this. That woman did not try to flinch. She just told me the truth as it is. I wasn't offended. Their culture is simply different. I think right now is a tough period for us. We are not living in a time of peace. It makes me feel worried. There's a kind of a divide. What do you mean by a divide? I mean, we argue about preserving our culture, we argue about things such as clothes, our religious rituals. Do you mean the younger generation wants changes? Yeah, they do not really follow our traditions. It's not good. You are a young couple. You do not have children yet. That's right. The logical question is, do you go into town to hang out? Let's say not even to a pub, uh, or just dancing. Do you do that? To go dancing in a pub? No. But it's only us. There are those who, who go. You don't party? No. We go out with friends sometimes. We meet in cafes or, what do you call it? A restaurant. Yes, a restaurant. I don't want this. I know that other couples like to go out, but we do not like partying. We prefer to stay in. How long have you been married? Almost five years. Five years. How old were you when you got married? I was 17. I was 19. Isn't that too early? It's fine for us here. Because nowadays people want to get married later, as they want to have more experience before they're married. I think we were mature enough to start a family. 14 or 15 would be too early. You have been together for more than four years. Are you planning to have children? Yes. Yes. How many children should a family have? It depends. But we plan to have four. Four? Yes. How do you choose names for children? Your names sound unusual for a modern Russian person. How do you choose them? For boys, then from the date he was born, we choose from a week ahead and a week back. If it's a girl, then it's possible to choose from two weeks ahead and two weeks back, because girls have fewer names. Do you mean each day has a name in your books? Yes. And I understand these are saints, and you can choose either a name that matches this day or a neighboring one. Exactly. Can you choose other names? No. You cannot choose any name you like. If I understand correctly, I've heard that you're getting ready for an important event. What event? Our daughter's getting married. The last one. I see. So she is the last of your seven children who is still not married. Who are you going to marry? 
Joachim Nikiforov. He lives 600 kilometers away from here. You're going to live there? Yes, in Goyas. It's a neighboring state where Avram Kalugin lives. And when is the wedding? <laughs> the matchmaking is on the 7th of May, and the wedding is on the 17th of May. What does the matchmaking look like? We've just discussed the matchmaking. We organized when our son was getting married, and she couldn't understand what this is. It's similar to an engagement. Oh, I see. I've heard this many times already. So it is an engagement. Can you tell me more about the process? Do you need your parents' permission if you want to get married? Yes, they came to see us when I returned from Canada. They came a week after I returned. What happens if the parents don't give permission? Does this happen? It happens. So what do you do? I don't know. I wonder what they would do. Sometimes it's the reason to break up. Sometimes a couple still stays together. It happens that after the wedding, they turn out to be relatives. At least seven generations should not be relatives. Eight. If they're relatives, they can't get married. Can you tell me more about this? Up to the seventh generation, so that means if they are fifth-degree relatives, they cannot get married? That's correct. But it's not that many of you living here. That's why we can't. Say we have neighbors living nearby, but we can't marry any of them because they're close relatives. At what age did you get married? I was 14. 14? Isn't that early? It is. When do you want to get married? I don't know. <laughs> How old are you now? I'm 19. Do you have to leave the community if you choose a husband from the outside? Of course. Either he will have to enter the community and accept our religion and culture, or the girl will have to leave. And then she would leave the village? Some people bring their partner. If they agree to accept our culture, our traditions, and to be baptized, we teach them how to pray and how to fast. Do you want Trifena to choose a husband from your community? Of course. Are you going to look for one? Of course. I've grown up in this culture, so I'm not willing to look for someone else from the outside. Some of my female friends left us for this reason. But I'm looking for a husband within our community. I've heard that your daughter will marry a person from a different religious movement. What does this mean? That's a problem. We did not like the idea, but if they love each other, we don't mind too much. Can you explain the idea of a different movement? It's hard to explain. Our beliefs are a bit different. So, they are old believers too, but your religion is still a bit different. Correct. We come from different areas and our thinking is a bit different. Each of us thinks that our religion is the right one. That means that you won't be able to pray together, right? That's right. You'll stay in touch, right? Is it a big problem for you? I'm not going to comment on this. Anfal is Avram's son. I saw a picture of him and his wife, Pelagia, together. I thought that she is a beautiful woman and offered to interview her, too. How did you meet each other? We met in Masap. There are many people with the same background as us. We go there to meet girls. 
So we met each other this way. This is a different community. It's about eight hours away from here. Yes. And you just traveled there to meet someone. Yes. Sounds like a big problem. You can only meet people who belong to this religion. So your choice is quite limited. You know, we do not see a problem here. I think it's fine. We can also go to Parana state to meet someone. We met each other this way. When someone is getting married, like someone is getting married soon in Primavera do Leste, many of us will attend the ceremony. And that is also a way to meet new people. We organize bridal showers before the weddings. A bride and a groom both come. Female friends sing while guys pay them for singing. Then they kiss them. You pay for the girls to sing? Yes, we pay. If they like the singing, guys can kiss girls. They kiss them. Like on the cheek? Yes, on the cheek. Actually, it's up to the girls. Is this to thank them for singing? Kind of. Did you sing songs? I did. Both girls and guys can attend your bridal showers? Yes. I see. In Russia, this bridal shower is for girls, while guys organize their own parties. The main purpose of these parties is drinking. Is your wedding dress ready? Yes. I've made three dresses. I need two more. No, three more. Why do you need so many for one wedding? One is for the engagement. The second one for the bridal party. I will attend two bridal parties. One will be here, another one will be there. Each event requires a new dress? Of course, I can't wear the same dress for everything. Sure, sure, you cannot. And the fourth dress is for the wedding? Yes, and the wedding lasts for two days. Can I see some of your dresses? Those you can show, not the wedding dress. It's okay, I can show this to you. How long did it take to make this? Not too long. It's a sundress. It doesn't take long to make. A dress takes longer, maybe a week or two. These are the presents. For the bridesmaids? These are presents for his family. There are 11 of them. Olympia, choose him the brightest shirt, so he'll be seen from a, from a distance. <laughs> I was looking into small sizes. <sighs> Where can I get changed? Looking good? All right, we're going to stay here. Look at how Tatiana and Trifena are dressed. Is this your casual clothing? Yes. Here's the evidence. Female clothes on the left, male clothes on the right. Did you make all of this? Yes. This is a sundress? No, we call it a talichka. This is a sundress. I see. Are you only allowed to wear this clothing? Yes. But we wear the sundress less often. It's for special occasions, such as prayers or weddings. Talichka is for every day. Do you make clothes for the whole family? No. Trithiana makes her own clothes. There was a great photographer of the 20th century, Prokudin Gorsky. 
He traveled a lot to Russian villages and took these color photos. It was at the beginning of the 20th century, before the revolution. He made this great photo album. Leonid Parfionov made a documentary about him called Russia in Bloom. When I look at you, your dresses, talichkas and sundresses, and I feel like I'm a part of these pictures. It feels so cool. A dress can be so important for our perception of women. And looking at both of you, I feel I'm in the 19th or at the beginning of the 20th century. You're laughing at me, but I'm fairly serious about it. I'm so impressed. I think you're used to it, but I am not. Other people in the town know us, so they do not pay attention to our clothing. In Rio Verde, yes, if we go to other cities, people look at us. They often ask where we are from and why we are dressed this way. We don't mind telling them. People praise us. No one says we are odd. Everyone praises our beautiful dresses. Some people say they are too shy to approach us and ask questions. This is Brazilians. Yes, they always compliment our clothing. Were your parents strict with you? They were strict, but it's fine. If they had not been strict, I would not have grown into who I am now. So I think that's good. They could tell me off, but it was good for me. I think it's okay. Are you allowed to choose your haircut? Can you have a short haircut? No. Do you have to have long hair in a braid? Yes. I don't have to braid my hair, but I cannot let my hair down. So you cannot let your hair down and you cannot have a short haircut. That's right. Can you use makeup? Yes, we can. Perfume? Yes. That's interesting. Can you color your hair? No. Rings, bracelets, chains, jewelry, all of this is allowed. I can see your ears are pierced. Yes, we're allowed to do that. I'm trying to learn more about your culture. Are you allowed to drink? We make our own home brew. I was told about this. Now you're not allowed to drink because of the great fast, right? That's right. We're allowed to have some on Sundays. Oh, really? Okay, that's allowed. How strict are you with fasting? Today we can't eat butter. In general, it's also meat, milk, chocolate. Alexei, what about you? The same? Just some homebrew on Sundays. Well, it's not meat. That's the homebrew that we heard of. Can you talk more about it? This one is made of dark grapes. This one, watermelon. This one, oranges. This one is made of cashew fruits. It's made from the same tree where you collect the cashew nuts. That's cashew brew. Yes. I think you're familiar with the nuts. This tree also has fruit. Really? I didn't know that. I think the smell of this brew might make my jet lag even worse. I might fall asleep right here. It would be a happy dream of an alcoholic. This is an orange brew, right? That's watermelon. This one feels stronger. Watermelon is a strong one. Are there alcoholics among the old believers? Yes. There are. Not many, but they exist. Because it doesn't depend on alcohol. It depends on the person. If a person has problems, alcohol might attract them. 
It's a problem for modern people. You start small. Then you become obsessed with it. Are you talking about going out to the town to buy some beer? Yes. To be honest, it's not allowed because we're not allowed to buy things in the town. We're only allowed to buy dry stuff. So what do you mean by dry stuff? Rice, flour, salt, everything else has to be made here? Yes. They're about to eat. We were invited for a lunch. I'm going to tell you about some nuances. They left to pray, but we're not filming it. We agreed from the beginning that we would not interfere in their religious life. We need to show our respect if we want to have a dialogue with them. There are some rules. We only use plastic dishes because the old believers cannot use the same dishes as we do. That's right. So that's the rule. The menu is exciting. Right now, the old believers are fasting. We were offered meat and sausages, but I refused, to the regret of our cameraman. We asked to eat the same food as they do. Though here, lunchtime is at 11 a.m., dinner is at 7 p.m., now it's 2.30 p.m. So they had to wait for us to have lunch. I'm really sorry about this. It's all right. What does your lunch look like during the fast? I see rice and beans here. What's this? Potato? No. It's a sweet potato. Batat. No, it's shushu. I don't know if you have it in Russia. No, we don't have that. This is Dima, whom you never see because he's our cameraman. Dima is also known as our main foodie. I really want you to try and let us know what you think. Is it tasty or not? What should I eat? Just eat everything you are offered. It's so good. It's like home-cooked. Dima was really worried about not eating meat. Is this enough for you? I think it's enough. I will just eat more than I normally do. You need less meat to be full. I heard that you stood for an election. That's right. Which one? I was in... That's politics. In a certain party. Yes. Which party was it? First, I was a Republican. And now? I quit. Well, not exactly. I have friends who stand for elections. When I'm asked for support, I help. Now I prefer the classical party. Is that the name of the party? Let's say we have an association of farmers. I am the head of this association. It's not a paid position. I do it because I like it. It's community service. Yes. Long story short, they promote the interests of the agricultural sector in the government. Right. Is Brazil corrupted? It's quite corrupted. It's similar to Russia in this way. The level of corruption is similarly high. I've noticed that all Russian farmers who live here support Bolsonaro. Is that right? Yes. Why is that? He stands for family values, for religion, and he is on the right wing. Let me explain something. There are no left-wingers among Russian old believers because back in the day, Bolsheviks forced them to leave the country. 
Then they were caught in China and forced to leave China, too. Understandably, they do not support left-wing parties. We know that in South America, parties of the left tend to be quite popular. However, now the president is conservative, and Russian farmers mostly support him. Yes, you are right. Judging by my idea of a Russian village, one to which you were much closer than everything that is now in Russia, there should be female gatherings when girls come together to chat, <laughs> gossip and discuss things. No, we do not have that. We are busy all the time. Some are sewing, some have other things to do. We meet on Sundays or during the holidays sometimes. How do you relax? Do you sing songs? Sometimes. You sing? Yes. But mostly we do it at weddings. What kinds of songs do you sing? Just Russian songs. We know many songs. We always try to learn new ones. I'm trying to think what songs you're talking about, like The Moon Has Turned Purple? Yes, we know this one. Roaring by call? Yeah, Roaring by call. Uh, and that song about a tramp, what's the name? Oh, I forgot the name of the song. <laughs> I understand. I'm the same. I need to drink a lot of your brew before I can start singing. <laughs> That's why we sing more at weddings. <laughs> Some things stay away from politics. Russian people are Russian people everywhere. We sing when we get drunk. You're right, that's the way we are. I've lived here for a long time. Then I went to Russia and I realized that our traditions came from there. We do it the way Russian people do. Our traditions come from there. Before I came here, I expected to see a village. How do we imagine it? One street, the houses are wall to wall, grannies are sitting, you can hear songs. Well, I imagined a pre-revolutionary village like that. Here, as you can see, everything is organized a little differently. Since the Russian old believers have a lot of land, there may be 200, 300, 500 meters, sometimes a kilometer, between the houses, which, according to our concepts, are cottages. And it's more likely to be not a village, maybe not even a large village, but a conglomeration of farms, fazendas, which are neighboring, but everyone lives their own lives. By the way, you may have noticed a woman in a hat that just passed by. There is a strict rule here that we have to follow. We can't just approach random people and start chatting. That's not acceptable here. We can only talk to people who have given us their consent in advance. I'm just trying to explain why I couldn't approach that woman and ask what she was holding. It's prohibited. What is the difference between old believers who live in Russia or Moscow, where it is in fashion, and those who live in Brazil? I would say the difference is in the type of people. It's the way I see it. What I mean is the old believers of South America, both men and women, they have a sense of self-respect. They have no internal conflicts or confusion. They're benevolent. They're willing to smile and communicate. And a sense of responsibility for themselves and their work. So you could say independence. 
which was wiped out by the Soviet government? Yes, this is what I was thinking. You're absolutely right. I often say that in Russia, everything rests on just a few people who make an effort to improve things. These people build the whole system, which will not function without them. So, we have this Agency for the Development of Human Capital in the Far East. Ivan Yefimov works in this agency. He's appointed to help the old believers who come back from South America. He helps them to settle in. Ivan gets a lot of good feedback because he really tries hard to help. We're going to meet him now. He's not one of those government officials who simply follow the instructions. This system would not have worked without him. There are many people truly engaged in the problem. Some of them work in the administration and in Primoria, the Far East. They do their job well, and that's inspiring. Some government officials become different people. Three years ago, people here in Primorsky Krai were very suspicious about our program. The attitude was rather negative. Now, some officials visit the old believers at the weekends. They seem to be friendly to each other. There is a theory that the Russian Far East is a vast territory and it needs to be populated. The idea was to invite the old believers over. They do not drink or smoke and they are hard working. Let's say they are perfect Russians. So the idea was that they can upgrade the Russian Far East. Am I correct? No. Okay, tell me what's going on here. We went to Svobodny city three years ago. It's based in Amur Oblast. It's not an artificial issue, this is reality. It turns out that in the city of Svobodny, thanks to the former mayor, a community appeared of 20 old believers. We met them, had a chat and realized that they deal with many problems, especially immigration problems, like it is hard to get citizenship and so on. We went deeper into the topic and realized that people from North and South America are keen to move to Russia. They want to move to the Far East themselves. Therefore, we started this discussion in the first place. Why the Far East? Well, you should ask them. Why do you want to move to the Far East? Uh, First of all, the sales market. China, China, Japan, Korea. The climate is good for soy and corn. There's enough sun there. So it's easy to sell and the lands are empty. Winters are brutal, but in summer the weather is good. Central Russia is more populated. The Far East is more spacious. We don't want to live in a city. We want to live in the countryside. We want to live at our own fazenda. That's our dream. They have their vision and their reasons to go. However, it's not about nostalgia or love for Russia. What is it about then? Economic reasons. Can you explain? Economic reasons. The most numerous group of old believers, about 100 people, moved from Bolivia. The Bolivian economic system is close to socialism. The old believers say that the Red Star has moved to Bolivia. Red Star stands for communism. You mean they're not worried about a tough life in Russia? They're more worried about socialism. After all these years, they're still running away from Soviet power and the Red Star. I'm not going there for political reasons. I just want to, how should I put it, return back home. This is the way I feel. In November, you told me that Russia feels like home. We are home here. It's not my motherland. It's my home. I watched that November interview. It's fascinating. 
прям такой сильный момент, потому что... You've never lived in Russia. That's right. In 2018, I went there for the first time. In recent years, Russia has become closer to us. We started to use the Internet. Also, Russia became a more open country. We used to have nothing but a few books for children, and that's it. That was our perception of Russia. Later, we had a chance to see Russia. I went there for the first time when I was 45. You were saying that Russia felt like home. Yes. Are many people advising you not to move there? They've been doing it ever since I've started thinking about it. Most people advise me against it. People who have never been there. There's a Russian saying that the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence. We should think the other way around. We should say the grass is greener on our side. Everything depends on us. It will be good if we make it good. If we do not make an effort, then we will not get the result. We cannot run away from ourselves. And that's why there is no point moving to another place? At this moment, yes, there is not much point. I'm not sure what will happen in the future. At the moment, I have things to do here. I'm not saying that Russia is a perfect place. It has both good and bad sides, just like any other place. I'm not expecting a paradise. I like Russian nature. I decided to make this change. If I do not move now, when my family and I are ready for that, I will regret it in the future. Let's see how he makes out over there, in Russia, how the Russians will welcome him, and then I will probably think about moving there. I see. You want to decide based on Avram's experience there. Yeah. Why should all of us go there at the same time? How many old believers moved here from other countries? About 120-130 people have moved in the past 10 years. Not too many. It's not many, but they've had around 30 children since then. You could say it's 150 of them now. Will you sell your property here before you go to Russia? Yeah. I will leave nothing behind. Many people ask me, what will I do if I decide to come back? I think I could live anywhere. 130 million people live in Russia. Why can't I? You can always create your own world, regardless of any circumstances like politics. I'm really worried that they might be deceived. That's what I worry about. Will it be disappointing for them? It will be a disappointment for them and a shame for us. Unfortunately, our current government does not function to benefit people. I mean, at least not to benefit people like them. These people are true believers. Belief is the main thing in their lives. It's really hard to explain to a modern person. Other people do not seem to be sure about their religion. The old believer's main treasure is their belief. It is what they live for. Ulyan Murichev, the head of an old believer's village in Dersu, told me in that place, God can hear them better. Our religion and culture come from Russia. Our saints are also from there. Say, in Brazil, we do not have sacred places. None at all? No. Here they're Catholics. 
к сожалению, я имею We get on well. I respect them. Я имею уважение к But it's not my religion. Но но это не моя религия. It's not my life. Это не моя жизнь. Ну вот, друзья, не знаю, как это сочетание у меня. To me, this area looks like a legendary, mythical place. This Russia is incredible. Things worked out here. This Russia could not exist in its real motherland. Strangely, it exists here, in Brazil. At the end of each episode, I invite you to draw your own conclusions. Well, I think here, words aren't necessary. Most of the locals ask me a puzzling question. I want to share it with you. Looking straight into my eyes, they ask, do you think we should move to Russia? Well, I did not know what to answer. On the one hand, I know what modern Russia is like. It's hard to advise someone who has a stable life, income, and family here to move to Russia. I don't want to take this responsibility. On the other hand, it might sound pathetic, but communication with these people made me want to be sincere. I want to say this sincerely. I love my country. I think we should have more people like the old believers in our country. The more, the merrier. What do I mean? We need more initiative. Decisive, brave, self-confident people who do not worry about the government or difficulties in their way, who will not get drunk and get depressed as soon as they face an obstacle, who will be dedicated to work on their land with their own hands, who will achieve what they aim for. We definitely need people like them. I don't know. Maybe we could also start acting like these people. It could be even our children or grandchildren. Please share your opinions in the comments. Would you advise the old believers to move? We will definitely watch those who are moving to Russia. I promise that if our show is still going, we will go to see them in the Russian Far East. We will visit them and see if our help is needed. If so, we will invite you to participate too. This is Redakcia. Don't forget to like and comment. See you soon.